Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Lob Box Live with your host, the Ghost Scientist. Join in our exciting conversations that are educational, informative, and oftentimes entertaining. So without further ado, this is Lob Box Live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Lob Box Live. I'm your host, the Ghost Scientist, and this is part two of a three-part series covering Nazi alien technology, the Philadelphia Experiment, and the Montauk Project. When we last ended our last program, we had just arrived in Long Island Sound with Vril on board. That's the uh, brought on board the U.S. Eldridge uh, by or during the first beginning stages of Operation Paperclip with Hans and uh, Hans von Kappler or Kamler. Uh, but before we go into all that, I would like to cover the official story. Okay. So the official story goes like this. July 22, 1943 was the first test of the Philadelphia Experiment. The final test of the first phase of the Philadelphia Experiment was August 12th of 1943, in which the ship went into hyperspace, which was a total disaster. According to researchers, even some witnesses, this ship, the USS Eldridge, was fitted out with an experimental electronic gear designed to make it invisible. By all accounts, the experiment was a disaster for the men on board, but that was only the beginning of the complex controversy that began in 1943 and continues into somewhat yet unknown future. You see, part of what went wrong was that the ship not only disappeared, it traveled 40 years into the future. The question for me is, was that a mistake or was that part of the experiment that worked? According to some researchers of the incident, Albert Einstein did complete his work on the unified field theory. He and other mathematicians did complete the equations which gave us the field for the invisibility. So my question are, or was, time travel experiments really going on at Fort Hero on Montauk Island in the 1980s? What was or is the Phoenix Project and who were the Montauk boys? Have researchers usurped the work of some of our greatest scientists in order to conduct secret studies on time travel, interdimensional transit, mind control without the participant's knowledge? Is it still going on to this day? Many parts of this fact fractured tale of technology gone berserk are hard to believe. Of that, there is no doubt. It reads like a combination of H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, and Brad Murphy. Yet our story is filled with names, places, and dates that are subject to verification, and a number of serious investigators have devoted a vast amount of time and money to doing just that. As you might expect, the Navy has not been particularly helpful ever since the story of the Philadelphia Experiment began circulating in 1956 and during the 19. Uh, 60s and 60 years between then and now, the United States Navy has steadfastly and emphatically denied that any such experiment took place. That technology to perform such a feat did not exist then and in fact does not exist today. What, does the, what do the records themselves and logbooks show, you might ask? Maybe we should take a breath here. <laughs> And a story that began with an experiment that began in World War II and radar invisibility has now become a sort of urban legend involving time travel. So let's look closely and see what we really know. Well, this is what we know so far. A man by the name of Carl Allen claimed to be a witness of the Eldridge disappearance, not of the teleportation. And it should be noted that right up to his death, Carl Allen never wavered from his original story. We also know there was a closed facility of some kind at Fort Hero in Montauk Island. It is, in fact, still there to this day. The Montauk facility is a very large underground base. The base stretches out for miles, uh, maybe upwards of five miles, give or take a mile. It would take a, research, a researcher upwards of 15 minutes to ride in a golf cart from one end to the other. And the computer technology housed there was the fastest technology that existed in the mid-70s, which were referred to as Cray 1s and Cray 2s, which were the fastest computers made at that time. And there are other researchers that claim having worked at Montauk at one time or another. Stuart Swardlow 
said he was picked up on one night while he was still in high school and brought there. He claims because of his genetic background and his family's history, he was taken into use at the facility at an early age and at an early phase initially. He claimed there were alien beings in control of the facility. However, later he claims that the military and under the guise of aliens were actually manipulating the project. His earliest re memories recollected mind-controlled techniques and tactics used on the test subjects so they could be later used for government project on the general public. Later on, he claims they went into genetic manipulations and then finally into time travel experimentation or the first phases of what he called Operation Looking Glass. Now we know that the government will confirm none of this to the contrary. They emphatically deny its mere existence. But independent testimony continues to suggest that something out of the ordinary did indeed take place there. Now, Carl Allen claims he has a lot of knowledge of the Montauk Project in his own words. In his own words, it's simple. I was there. He claims to also have built some of the equipment that bends space and time and performed mind control. Carl Allen says in 1968 he was brought into the project, and it was a carry-on from the Philadelphia experiment. He claims to also have been given the final report of the experiment to review actually listed Cameron's brother, Ed, and Duncan Cameron. The first question in my mind is, has our government been involved in something so secretive and experimental in its past and prior to these wild claims by so-called conspiracy theorists? Our government has not always been forthcoming and honest about certain government projects. Some have gone as far as claiming a conspiracy our government experimented on soldiers and prisoners without the participants' knowledge. Have there been secret experiments affecting whole populations? Did the Navy actually attempt to make a World War II ship invisible? And is it possible the experiment actually worked, but that the ship reappeared in another naval yard hundreds of miles away? And not only a hundreds of miles away, but years in the future. If there were such an experiment, did the crew know about it, or were they used as unwitting guinea pigs? Has the government used individual groups, even whole cities, as a test subject without telling them about it? For years, there were rumors of a secret, bizarre experiment has filtered their way into the media through strange and unlikely sources. For example, Nazi doctors on trial at Nuremberg following World War II sought to justify their actions by citing a U.S. government project, an experiment in Chicago using some 400 prisoners and injecting them with malaria in order to study new and experimental drugs. Whether or not the prisoners were told what was to happen to them is still open for question, but this, of course, was not the first report of such unwarranted and unwanted experimentation by our government. One of the scariest ex experimentations I can recount happened in 1931. Uh, Dr. Cornelius Rhodes of the Rockefeller Institute of Medicine, and, and I do say that again, the, Rock the Rockefeller Institute of Medicine, uh, knowingly infected his patients with cancer. Dr. Rhodes uh, went on to direct and establish the U.S. Army Chemical Warfare Laboratories in Maryland Utah and the Panama Canal Zone, later becoming Camp Sherman, one of the places I myself trained at. One of the largest intentional releases of radiation in history took place at Hannaford, known as the Green Run. It was purposely kept from the public for nearly 40 years. Later, documents released by the Department of Energy showed that Hannaford had secretly released 80,000 curies of radioactive iodine. Allegedly, the radiation was released to monitor the radioactive plume stretching across Oregon and Washington. This, according to them, was used to evaluate equipment used for detecting Soviet plutonium plants. No one living there during that time was ever warned of such an experiment taking place, and the Green Run was only re uh, one release that we know of. But from 1947 till 1949, Hannaford released an estimated 685,000 curies of radiation into the environment. 
to bring the point closer to home, we have been recent, or we've had recent reports of contrails, gaseous substances left in the wake of jet planes flying high above multiple areas of the country. There is a mysterious sickness that seems to be centered around the supposed chemtrails left by KC-135s and KC-10s. Aerial tankers are supposedly seeding clouds. Once again, officially, the government denies being involved in any such acts, but in recent articles, Tommy Farmer, a former engineer technician with Raytheon Missile Systems, says he has collected samples of what he claims to be angel hair sprayed by the mysterious aircraft on 16 occasions from 19 to present. Now you may be asking yourself, why am I telling you all about all these things that have nothing to do with the Philadelphia experiment? And my answer for you is simple, really. Would the government be involved in secret programs? Have secret agendas, and is it possible that some of these individuals, or maybe even and all of these individuals are telling the truth, or even part of the truth based on their own experiences. I would personally say yes, it is very possible, if not probable, that these type of experiments and experimentation place. So getting back to our experiment, our story begins in 1956. A gentleman by the name of Morris K. Jessup, a University of Mathematics and Astronomy instructor with a keen interest in Einstein's unified field theory, re re uh, received the first of two letters from a man he signed himself, Carlos Miguel Allende, or Carl Allen. In these ramblings, almost incoherent letters, Allen warned Jessup to forget his interest in the unified the field theory stating that the U.S. Navy had already tried it on a destroyer-type ship in 1943. According to Allen, in his own words, the result was, and still stands today, as proof that the unified field theory, to a certain extent, is correct. The result was complete invisibility of a ship, all of its crew, and Jessup assumed, oh, and, uh, and all of its crew, Jessup assumed that the letters had come to him because of a book he had published in 1955 entitled The Case for UFOs. Now, if you haven't read this particular novel, I would suggest you do. It's a very interesting read indeed. Jessup's book had made its way around several government bigwigs in Washington, D.C. And one of his notated copies made its way to the Office of Naval Research, and its notations drew the attentions of two ONR officers. The officers claimed that their interest was purely personal and had nothing to do with the naval research. Still, they had called Jessup in to evaluate his notations. <clears throat> Jessup had received another letter from Allen within just a few days of the first when he opened his mail. This is what the read. I wish to mention somehow also the experimental ship disappeared from its Philadelphia dock and only a very few minutes later appeared at its other dock in Norfolk, Port, Portsmouth area. This was distinctly and clearly identified as being that place, but the ship then again disappeared and went back to the Philadelphia dock in only a very few minutes. Now, these two locations are some 400 miles apart, and it would have taken days, not minutes, uh, to get a destroyer-type vessel from one berth to the other and back. The letters, however, seemed al alternately de desperate and angry and occasionally pleading Jessup, so Jessup turned the two letters over to the two naval officers whom had the notation and the notated copy of his book. He was sure he had told them that some of the notations in the book were Allen's. Whether or not Jessup made any further inquests is unknown to us, his involvement ended on the evening of April 20th, 1959, when he was found dead in his station wagon in Dade County Park, Florida. Jessup, it had appeared, committed suicide. And of course, Jessup's friends insist that he has and was not the kind of man to commit suicide, but nothing was ever found to digest, uh, suggest anything else. But one thing that was certain in the three years since he had received the letters from Allen and death, 
Joseph had been the main factor in seeing to it that the tight lid uh, secrecy surrounding the Philadelphia experiment was ripped away. The Navy, while insisting that no such experiment ever took place, was nevertheless very much interested in anyone requesting information about the USS Eldridge. And nearly 30 years later, Alfred Bielek would, according to some, make it impossible for the lid of secrecy to be placed back on the experiment as a whole. Alfred Bielek, uh, Bielek original family name, is Edward Cameron. When he first became aware of his involvement in the Philadelphia Experiment in January of 1988, he claims he had no idea how extensive his use by the government had been, nor were, were he or was he, uh, nor were his claims his research would lead uh, lead to. But according to him, it included the Philadelphia Experiment, the Montauk Project, mind control. According to him, aliens, and, and it, all it fits together in his mind. So basically, he slammed all this stuff together, the Philadelphia Experiment, Montauk Project, and aliens. Now, I personally believe, as being having researched this for some that uh, that there was a reason why he put all of these three together. And it leads into the last program that we did on here last Saturday, and we'll get to that as I get through this. Claims to have vital information, that being Bielek, Alfred Bielek claims to have vital information that he needed to get out to the public, and which is why he gave his story to begin with. The question, of course, is what was the Philadelphia experiment exactly? Why would the U.S. Navy be spearheading the project in the first place? At the time of the Philadelphia experiment, German U-boats were destroying nearly half of the ships that, cro that were crossing the Atlantic. Both the British Admiralty and the U.S. Navy were desperate for answers and needed to find a way to combat these lethal technologies. If scientists on the caliber of Albert Einstein and Nikola Tesla had even remotely suggested the possibility of turning a large naval ship invisible, you can bet the U.S. Navy would have jumped on that in a heartbeat. But I suggest that something else may have occurred. I suggest that all of this was to cover up something even darker that may have been on board the vessel and later researched at Montauk Island, that being the sphere, the vril, the dicloque device gained by the U.S. during the early formations of Operation Paperclip. And Einstein and Tesla would both work on plans to try and harness this object and its energetic properties, and maybe even open a portal or portals into other dimensions or time and space. So when we ended the last time, uh, when we ended the last time in the in the last program, we were discussing the fact that uh, Hamler and Werner von Braun had been working in conjunction with agents from the United States government in order to bring. Kamler and his team of some 65 to 68 researchers were originally working on a, a known project, with that being the one of the V1 and V2 rocket project. Uh, and the United States government was extremely interested in that specific project, so that Werner von Braun decided that he was going to create a negotiation or start a negotiation between the United States, because this is during 1943 through 1945. And during that time period, you had the Nazi regime, who looked like it was falling apart during that time. And uh, Werner von Braun and, of course, Hans, uh, Hans von Kammler, who was third in charge of the Reich at the time, saw the collapse happening. They saw it coming. So. Kamler didn't want to stop his research that he had been doing from the Vril that they had brought back from the Himalayan uh, mountains uh, out of, you know, within inside the mountain. And of course, if you want to hear that portion of it, the his history, the initial starting of the history, you, of course, can go back and listen to the last program or last Saturday's program, which was on the, the Nazi alien technology that they found to the forest or the woods of uh, Germany, uh, creating the German 
all kinds of technology that they were trying to formulate around what Albert Einstein had been working on in energies. So here we have uh, Werner von Braun and Kamler uh, making a negotiation with US agents. They then find a way to bring this vril that was inside the Dicloque, the bell, the German bell, or the designed German bell, put it on board the USS Eldridge to bring back here to the United States to study. Uh, in doing so, they got the involvement of Albert Einstein and Nikola Tesla, uh, who both at that time were the top scientists or the most intelligent scientists uh, during their age. And the United States government wanted to know what was this vril? What, what was this specific object or this space that uh, occupied this space on the ship? And when they arrived in the sound, during the same time frame that this is all taking place, there was high energy radar technology that was being worked on. The first stages of high energy aerial radar. For whatever reason, when this ship entered into Long Island Sound, the radar system or the waves, the resonating field frequency that this radar system somehow energized this particular sphere. And with the naval officers and personnel on board this vessel, this particular sphere released its energy, thereby changing dimensional space around the outside of the vessel, phase shifting the vessel itself from its specific location in, in Long Island Center, and reappearing in the 1980s. Uh, and there are images and pictures that supposedly exist of whether or not I personally believe that the images are real. I don't discount the stories that have been told by eyewitnesses that supposedly remember seeing this particular vessel reappearing. I believe it's a night. Welcome to look this up so you get the date correct. But if you do your own research, you'll be able to find these specific images that they claim happen to be the images. But if you see the image, the image looks very foggy. It's very blurry, just like most the majority of CT images are. I mean, it's, they're, they're not, it's not like you're getting an image that's plain and clear and you see USS Eldridge on the side of it. It's kind of in the distance through some fog and the image is very dark and but the outline has been said to be the USS Eldridge. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> what we what supposedly has a particular sphere, this vril, gives off this energy source. Somehow this energy source opens up this portal or dimensional source, and the ship disappears. Now According to uh, documentation by eyewitnesses, and you're welcome to up, uh, when the ship reappears, not only did the ship disappear from its location in Long Island Sound, but somehow between its travel from the future back to its present location in, in 1943, and this is roughly during that August uh, 12th event, uh, the dimensional space warps space-time somehow. Not only does it warp space-time, but it somehow warps the molecular structure and physical structure of the body of the vessel. Not only the body of the vessel itself, but also of the body of the people themselves. So that when the ship reappears in Long Island Sound, it now has an infusion of the sailors who are on board, the officers who are on board, and the metal or metallurgic objects or materials that are part of this particular vessel. Now, again, there's no physical documentation. I'm not saying that this particular event took place. 
And I'm also not expecting or saying that, uh, that it's all correct. What I'm saying is, is that it fits the information that's out there. It fits the pieces of the puzzle, if you read through the research. The pieces of the puzzle seem to correlesce into this entire uh, organized outcome, if you will. Now, now the vessel comes back. They have a report of this particular incident taking place, and they're extremely scared at this point. The government personnel, the U.S. agents that are in charge of this particular project from Naval Research Center, is they're extremely scared of what this technology may be capable of doing. Of course, not only because of what is shown by them by these people being infused into the ship itself, but there are some of them that actually come back out the opposing side. And before we go to having the Vril actually move from its location on board the Eldridge and into the facility or the underground facility of Ontoc, I'd like to discuss what that, those possibilities uh, may have been, possibly could have been. It's possible that, like we were saying, or like I was saying before in the first program, the real very well could have been an energy source or a propulsion some type of a propulsion system, according to me, this is my own personal opinion from everything that I've read, everything that I've researched, and again, I'm not claiming that this is all real, I'm claiming from what I've read and what I've gone through, reading, specifically historical stuff, and from eyewitness accounts, I believe purposely that this particular uh, sphere was a propulsion system for a vessel, that a alien aircraft or an alien craft outside of this particular dimensional space crashed into the mountain in Tibet. And what these Tibetan, uh, what the Tibetan monks had found was this propulsion system. Now, from an engineering standpoint, and and physicist and an engineer myself, I, I can see how this, how this particular incident could happen on board the Eldridge later on in Long Island Sound by it phase shifting uh, from one location to another and one time frame to another. If I would ask the question, I would ask the question, what or why, uh, why or how, I should say, ex excuse me, how would, how would a alien vessel, if it existed, let's say hindsight's 2020, and, and we agree, we all agree, that alien technology exists. Aliens have some form of highly advanced, highly or biomechanical device that they somehow travel in interdimensionally or across space and time. How could this be possible? What from us, you know, what from my understanding of science and engineering and molecular structures, how could that possibly be? And, and what would you need? Well, firstly, you'd need to have some sort of a device that had perpetual energy or utilized some zero point field of energy because otherwise you'd be, you, the amount of fuel source that you would need, even if you're talking about fuel sources such as thorium or something uh, it, with inside the physical realm of, of energy that we currently have, even, even in the source of thorium, the amount of energy that it would take 
in order to uh, create some sort of portational device or some sort of portal from one dimension to the next uh, would take an awful lot of energy. Uh, and being that energy can neither be destroyed or uh, created, it just simply is there. You only utilize it from one form to the next, whether that be in whatever format or, or whatever device that you're engineering or designing. Um, Instead, you would have to have some other type of energy or some other type of energetic source or energetic property that you were tapping into and getting uh, a source of, if you will. And it's possible uh, that it, it's possible that this particular vril, this this uh, this object that has gone and traveled through historical time and space, literally. Uh, to the point at which we're on the Eldridge and prior to going to Montauk, uh, as it's described as, as it's described in its description of its, its visual look, its, its operational effects, if you will, how it, uh, how it actually reverberates energy or takes energy in and actually saps energy and we'll get into the, the sapping of energy later on and some really interesting points to that when it actually arrives at its, uh, the, the final phase of its, uh, of its testing, if you will, at, uh, at Montauk 1. And then, of course, moves to Montauk 2 uh, later on after that, that uh, facility was known. But in this technology itself, in of the Vril itself, the question becomes, well, how would you utilize that specific technology? How would it operate? Well, interestingly enough, Einstein asked the same exact question. He says, well, here he's observing this specific sphere. He's this energy source that's this uh, anti-gravitational ball of energy. on this vessel and tries to figure out exactly how this uh, particular uh, gear operates or works, if you will. He then begins to contemplate and think deeply about this particular object. And he noticed something very interesting. As he begins to think about and, and concentrate on this particular object and what it may or may not be, the object seems to take in energy. He feels sapped. He becomes drained, if you will, uh, and maybe that he be, feels like he's drained simply because he's in deep thought. I suggest that that's not the case. I think that the, the, because he was thinking of the specific object itself, that somehow the transference of the energy of his brain waves thinking of this specific object, that the, the object itself tuned itself into that specific frequency, that being somewhere between the 6 and 8 hertz range, uh, tuned into that specific frequency and began to drain the energy from him because he was trying to think of it, uh, of the object itself. And that begins, you know, that, that becomes very interesting later on as we go through this, uh, through this part three phase or the, the third stage of this, uh, this frill object. Third phase of this uh, frill object, if you will. And um, start contemplating that maybe this object is not uh, at all what uh, they're trying to use it for. Here they are, they're bombarding it with all kinds of energy sources, uh, electrical current, sound waves, sound vibrations, blah, 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 blah. They're using all these different technologies that are hard technologies that they have. He begins to believe that maybe that it's not physical energy that makes this particular device operate, but that the device itself or the object itself operates 
through some form of telepathic or teleportation style uh, concept or thinking, if you will. That if you concentrated on this particular object long enough and hard enough, that it somehow would transport you to a specific time and place. The naval agents who are at this time working in charge of this project, or at least they're the face that these researchers get to see as part of the face of this, this project, uh, decide that this certain phase, or this phase shifting uh, of this vessel becoming invisible, because of course they believed that the, uh, originally they believed that the, the technology only made the vessel invisible. They really didn't contemplate the fact that maybe that the vessel not only, you know, was invisible to human sight, but that the vessel actually transmitted across dimensional space and time. And then, of course, coming back and resting back in uh, Long Island Sound. So they're more interested in the mechanical, the physical, if you will, the physical operation of it, and not so much about trying to research what the object actually is. From a scientific standpoint, Einstein and Nikola Tesla both didn't see it as that. They both looked at it as, what is this specific object? Where did it come from? How was it formed? Who actually built and created this specific object? And uh, what could its possible uses be? You know, is, is this what I suggest it is, which is a propulsion system that operates through some telepathic uh, operation? And, and uh, again, I'll get into that more in the last part of this. But uh, it then comes off the vessel after this particular incident takes place. The Vril is taken off of uh, the vessel inside of this, uh, this bell, this bell housing that was created by Kamler and his And Kamler and his team are brought to the United States to take over this project of the research that they had already been doing with these Nazis, uh, the Nazi research center that they had in Germany. Uh, and we start to see this first formation of a underground dumb facility or deep military underground base uh, testing facility known as Montauk. Uh, the device, when it's taken off the vessel, tends to create a lot of heat. Uh, gives off a lot of heat. And uh, at the time, they had no idea why. They didn't understand what was happening. They didn't understand that these radio waves, uh, these the radar waves that were in the air that they had been testing at the time had been affecting this specific, this, this real object. <coughs> and it was reverberating the energy back out to its surroundings. So it was important for them to pick this specific location because they had access to the sound and the water and the sound. And they had designed a silo, basically, an underground silo, a large round silo that went down into the ground that was filled with water that they had planned on putting this vril into. And uh, decided to put it into that to keep it cool number one, and secondly, somehow keep the energetic properties of it contained within inside of this. They thought they would use the water that was surrounding it as a shield or shielding of this particular source of energy, that it would dampen it in some manner or form. When it's taken down inside of the Montauk facility and placed inside of this silo, they begin trying to run tests on this. They're observational tests, uh, scientific examples and tests that they're doing. And they start noticing that the guards who are uh, in charge of 
standing outside of the doorway or the door facility in um, that they become they're becoming mentally affected in some way. Uh, they start claiming that they're losing time, uh, that they are, you know, that they say, well, I, you know, I'm I've lost three hours of this particular time frame from this time this time frame and don't remember anything that took place during this time frame. And when questioned and, and interviewed questioned and interviewed, they can't recall anything. Can't recall ever being part of this particular experiment. They can't recall being part of this until they're taken under deep regressive uh, hypnosis and depression. Uh, but when they're later on put through uh, this hypnosis process, they then recall being transported to different times and space. Uh, and during the interviews and during their debriefings, their debriefing stages, uh, these documents or these documents are written and, and spoken of as, well, where did you go? Where did you end up? And what, what things took place? Uh, and, and according to one of these, according to one of the people that were, was part of this uh, operation and this project, um, He says, or he claims, in his statement that he uh, met uh, this alien being who spoke to him and told him the dangers of having this specific object or this specific vril, if you will, that was brought there. And he relays this information uh, to the people who are there, the researchers who are there at Montauk. And, you know, at first they don't believe him. They don't believe that this, this, uh, that this particular incident, you know, that, that what he's claiming to have happened to him actually took place. Yet he begins to draw out and design uh, some sort of device. Uh, you know this this object uh, that he starts uh, drawing out uh, gains the interest of several engineers who are looking at his drawings and of course trying to figure out where is this stuff coming from how is this information being placed inside of this particular soldier's head and they also notice that the soldier himself is becoming extremely ill. He starts uh, showing signs of lesions on the surface of his skin. He begins to lose his hair. Uh, and signs that we may say are signs of radioactive poisoning or, or, or cellular damage or cellular disassociation uh, due to radio being in uh, direct contact with radioactive particles. Um, so before this young man, who's, who's this soldier that was guarding the front door of this thing, uh, passes, uh, before he actually passes away, he finishes the majority of these drawings that he claims is being fed into his head. And he's claiming that these images and designs are being fed into his head by this object, that this object is somehow telepathically speaking to him and injecting these images directly into his head, and, and that this particular device that he's trying to uh, describe to these engineers who are then drawing this thing out, uh, he claims is the machine that can operate this specific object. 
So without having any other information about this whatsoever, they, uh, you know, and, and these engineers who are sitting here looking at this device that they're drawing and claiming that, hey, you know, this, maybe this actually has something to do with something, and maybe this specific uh, device that we're drawing here could actually be built and will help make this particular object function in some manner. They decide that they're going to build this thing. They're going to start actually engineering these parts and these, uh, these materials. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen, and I'm sure being that you're members of a CT site and you're members of LopVox and you're members of LopChat, that I'm sure you've seen uh, the movie called Contact. And, where, and whereas the movie Contact uh, has this same type of story, and that to me is interesting, that I personally believe whoever wrote that script, or the, the original writer of that specific script, had been researching uh, this same type of, of research, or had been doing this same type of research, and wrote about this specific incident, except into this fanatical, fantastical, mythical movie and script. But a lot of what he writes about, uh, the, this, this eccentric uh, billionaire character, if you will, who is funding this particular secret project and building this object or building this specific object. And strangely enough, the descriptions that are given about what the object, the original design, looked like was very much similar to the design and imagery that we see later on in this movie, Contact. Now, I don't find that as being a, a, uh, a coincidence, if you will. I don't see that being coincidental. And, and knowing what I've known about this, you know, these illuminated ones, if you want, or these people working in underground secrecy or the dark black government operations, uh, they have a really weird rule about them. And, and the rule is this. <laughs> as long as they tell the public what they're doing, as long as they give the information out to the public and the public does nothing to stop it or nothing to stop it from taking place, you are complicit in their plan, if you will. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to come out directly to the public and claim directly to you that this is what we're doing and this is how it's being done and this is who is involved and these are the people. All they're saying is they have to let you know. They, they have to somehow put it out to the populace, to the society as a whole, to make you aware that these types of projects are going on. Uh, I'm not sure why this particular rule is, but it seems that that's the case. And, of course, with inside of uh, esoteric teachings and studies, going back to Flamel and John Dee, uh, it's spoken of as the same way, that the first rule, you know, one of their rules, or one of the first rules is that they have to let you know that this is actually taking place. And I believe that uh, the media and entertainment, uh, from what I've seen and what I've researched, because of having researched historical stuff and then gone back through and watched it and go, wow, it's obvious that these shows and programs and, and films are putting out to the public what these projects consisted of. Now the question becomes is why inundated, if you will, with all of these films and movies and TV shows and music and media and broadcast and news and all these reports all coming out now. I don't believe it is about money. I believe it's about telling the public what their plan is. And it's your job or my job or other people with inside of the CT community's job to try to put those pieces of the puzzle together 
to create a whole or an entire picture of what may or may not be, and to also understand of where this may be going. What exactly is their specific plan? So <clears throat> getting back to the design and operation of this specific device, and I'm not going to go too much into detail on the Montauk uh, stuff, because next Saturday I plan on covering all of the Montauk stuff. And uh, I'm getting towards the end of this, uh, of this particular process, or this particular Philadelphia experiment information. This part of it, as far as what I can tell from, from the puzzle piece that it fills, this part of it is more about uh, how this particular object or this particular device made its way to the US or was brought here and the first incidents that we see of what this particular object may or may not be. Uh, if you have not covered or if you have not listened to the first uh, program, the first, the first series of the I suggest you go back and listen to it, and then listen to this again uh, prior to next Saturday if you, if you get the chance. Listen to two, both of these programs, because next Saturday is when we get into the Montauk uh, information. It's a lot of information that comes out uh, when this device actually first starts getting tested on at the Montauk facility. And, and later, it's movements, and, and movements to this present day, by the way. Uh, this still being utilized and still being used for its specific purpose, or for the purpose that it was tasked for, if you will, or tasked for by uh, agents working with inside of the government that are, that are working on technologies. Um, next Saturday, we get into more of what comes out of this Vril. And I'm not talking about just specifically um, this, this information or telepathic information being given to individuals, but physically what comes out of this particular sphere. Uh, and when it makes its way to this <laughs> location, uh, it becomes very interesting, I, I should say the least. And, and again, I'm not going to cover too much of that. But uh, we now have gotten through the Philadelphia information, if you will, of this particular stage of, of So I'm going to take about a five-minute break here uh, and let the let the audience here at Lotvox Live and the chat participants that are at Lotvox Live take a time to maybe write out a few questions, and I'll take some questions and answers after the fact, and we'll get through those answers and questions after the next five minutes. This is Lotvox Live. I'm your host, the Ghost Scientist, and Welcome back to Lopvox Live. This is your host, the Ghost Scientist. And uh, we just finished the second part of a three-part series on technology, the Philadelphia Experiment, and the Montauk Project. And uh, we finished up the, uh, the narrative, if you will, of the, of the Philadelphia Experiment and, and got to where the Vril had been moved from inside the Dicloque device into the Montauk facility. So I'm going to open up the uh, room to questions and try to answer them the best of my ability and to the best of my knowledge as far as the research is concerned. So I then lead it to you guys. What is the questions that you'd like to have answered?
And of course, you're welcome to mic up so that you can be recorded and or. We have a question from Luke in a room, a cool hand Luke. Why did it only go forward? so much in time and not further? Now, that's a good question. Uh, and I don't think that there's a really good answer for that question. Maybe it was a matter of the amount of energy that was stored or the amount of energy that the Vril took in. Maybe it only specifically had enough energy to resonate itself that specific frequency that then uh, transported the vessel to that specific time and space uh, 80s, and then when that energy then reverberated outwards from the vessel, it then tuned itself back to its own time frame or back to the own time, uh, its own time frame. Three. So that's a very good uh, that's a very good possibility. Prop has a question. Uh, Props asks, is it true some of the semen got embedded in the walls and hull of the ship, and that's how they died? Well, according to the documentation, that is exactly true, or, or according to eyewitnesses, you know, eyewitness reports and claim to have been part of that project, claim that that actually took place, that, that several of the uh, officers and naval personnel who were on board the vessel when the ship reappears in 1943 that when the ship phases to a physical uh, thing like a physical object that they were embedded or, or part of their molecular structure was uh, intertwined with the hull and, and objects not just the hull but actually other objects that were on the vessel and, uh, and several of them did not sustain their injuries and, and succumbed to their injuries and, and did die or were already dead on arrival. Nolo is in the room and Nolo asked, how is it steered so that the ship went from port to port and not port to mountaintop? That's another good question. And I've actually asked that question myself and, and this is my hypothesis. Uh, I theorize that the reason why the vessel went from the port in Long Island to the port in Norfolk was due to the radar system. Both of those locations were, were uh, at the time using high aerial radar transmissions and testing of high aerial radar transmissions. And, and my theory is, is that the device itself somehow uh, was linked, like it, it, it tuned into that specific frequency between these two locations. And somehow that specific frequency was not only was a frequency that was physically in this dimensional time and space, but that frequency had an underlying frequency that, that uh, superseded time and space, if you will. So it, it, it transported itself from this specific time and, and somehow retunes itself to that specific frequency in Norfolk due to the operation of high aerial radar. At least that's my own personal opinion. I'm not saying that that's how it actually took place and I'm not saying that that's the facts. What I'm saying is it's very possible that from a scientific standpoint that that could have been the case. Scarlett asks, do you think the distance uh, transported uh, might be related to Earth's rotation? Well, here's an interesting, that, that's interesting that you bring that up because that's also another uh, theory that, uh, that could be possible that I've contemplated as well, which is we, uh, we on this planet are not traveling specifically in the manner in which that you saw the model in school, meaning that we're not on this uh, flat plane moving around on these uh, sphere objects uh, <coughs> rotating around this uh, specific 
uh, celestial body, the sun. Uh, if you actually were to look at the model, the, a true model of how we're traveling through space, if you will, we're moving through uh, a vortices. The, the celestial bodies are, are, are moving in a vortex, and we're kind of spinning behind these objects, though it appears that we're spinning uh, along with these objects. Now, with that being said, if something was to phase, if you somehow were capable of creating a, a portation device or a teleportation device or a time machine, if you will, if that technology were possible, I would suggest that it would be impossible to go backwards, that it would be possible to go backwards in time and space but it would then be possible to go forward in time and space. This is the reason why. Because of the location that we currently are in at this time and space, that once a, a device, once you did not occupy this specific time and space and you tried to go backwards in time, that the planet Earth and, and the location that you left from would not exist. It would not be in that specific time and space. But if you were to go forward, in that momentum that you could pinpoint or you would come back to a location at which the planet was there, an interception point, correct. Uh, no, no low set interception, and I would say that that's correct, that, it, that we, in, we could intercept the location, but we could not then uh, go back to a new location. Now, it may be that the object itself, the Eldridge, never left the sound. Kind of follow my train of thought, if you will, that the Eldridge itself never actually leaves the sound. It simply phase shifts from its location being in the sound to a secondary location that then is in another port. At least that's what my, uh, that's what m I personally, uh, my own personal opinion, my own personal theory is. Uh, Pop has another question, and his question is, if they did this back in 1945, what are they doing now? Is it naive to believe they just quit this stuff? Well, according to everything that I've researched, it's not. That, that uh, it's definitely not naive to believe that they quit it because they haven't. They've, this project has continued on since the first inceptions of Operation or Project Rainbow uh, and, and much past 1945. And <laughs> really now in this time and, 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 and period uh, has come a long distance. They've, they've learned a lot for over these last 60 some years since this, uh, since this particular, since we first hear about uh, this particular uh, project. In this 60 years we've, we've come a very long way technologically wise and in the build out in, of technology and, and what we're currently working Uh, no, the years are correct. It's between 194. There's no specific dates. We again, like I said in the first program, the beginning stages of this are in 1943, but goes through 45. And there's some incidences that actually take place during 1947 that uh, from the Philadelphia experiment itself. And you can read several books. I'm not going to read them to you, but there's lots of different books on this about uh, the seven that correlates with uh, the incident at Roswell, New Mexico. Um, specifically, the reason why that the specific aircraft or the specific uh, vessel that crash lands in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, ha is also affected by uh, high aerial radar. Uh, we had just built a high aerial radar antenna in northern not too many miles uh, actually from where Roswell is, and that uh, somehow these two objects, uh, when this incident takes place, 
somehow these two objects coalesce with each other, that they all do, not just these specific ones, but the, the object that they had moved um, from Montauk after its experimentation, its, its data, um, and not to the location that you may think it was moved to. Everyone think, or when you say Nevada, they think of Area 51. But uh, that is not the location where this is actually taken to. It's taken to, uh, to a point called Tonopah, or Tonopah Test Range in Nevada. <coughs> and a place called the Pony Ranch. And if you've never researched the Pony Ranch, you might find that. Luke has another question here. It is, is there any damage on time and space by doing these experiments? Well, again, that's a good question, and I don't know. I have no idea if there is damage on it or, or possible damage that's taken place because of them trying to manipulate or, or this particular device or the devices that they end up engineering. There are several disasters that take place around this particular object and around the, uh, the given about this uh, particular and the utilization or them trying to utilize this object for a physical purpose. Several incidents of, of entire teams of researchers uh, having died uh, at the hands of this as well as uh, infrastructure, a major uh, U.S. infrastructure, especially energy's infrastructure, being damaged and wiped out due to this particular attack. Are there any other questions about the uh, about the program, uh, or will close one of the two? Well, if there's no more questions in the chat, uh, this is, well, have they tried this again on other ships? Uh, not on other Navy vessels, not on other uh, boats, if you will. And, and, and ships are, is a broad term. And we'll get into a lot of that uh, uh, later on or in this, uh, the third part or the third stage of this uh, program. I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in to Lopvox Live. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's uh, put into this program. Uh, and of course, I thank you, the listeners, for listening into the program. Hopefully you get a chance, if you didn't get to listen to this program, uh, that you get to listen to the program on YouTube biased propaganda website or at Lop Vox, uh, at Lop Radio. So uh, once again, this is Lop Vox Live. I'm your host, the Ghost Scientist, and as always, as being here, and I appreciate all the listeners. Please tune in next Saturday, and we're going to do it next Saturday at the 7 p.m., the regular time. I tried to do this at uh, 10 a.m. this morning to try to include listeners. I had gotten several messages about all got the tune in, um, but, but our producer, uh, it seems our producer, next Saturday, same bat time, same bat channel, I'll see you all next Saturday. So again, from Lotvox Live, this has been the Ghost Scientist, and I thank you.